of different aspects of your life flushed out. So having your hobbies, having your family, having your friends, right? I think some of that depression can be exacerbated by being singularly focused only on one or two things in your life. Oh, I have work. I have to pay the bills. I have work. I have to pay the bills. You get that monotony, that lack of variety. It's pretty, uh, it exacerbates whatever baseline you might begin with. And in the case of uh, me back in high school, um, I did climb out of it. I did, did get through it. And in fact, you could argue I eventually got to a healthy state of living with people that I trusted. And you, of course, being one of them. Uh, and that was that was a good time. That was good. Um, having people that you trust and that trust you is, oh, the, the what it does to biologically, because that's the main point of this. Biologically, what that does is we are facing something together, not separate. This is not every man for himself. And that already is so uplifting for someone who's a pessimist. So you need to have people like that in your life. It, it makes it makes life way less miserable and you can actually fight things that were way bigger than you, what you could fight on your own. And I know people have said this and it's cliche, but nonetheless, that's so important for people to hear. You need to have people that have your back because there's so many times where you're over in at work or you're in your hobbies and it's just everyone's doing their own thing and no one's looking out for each other. Very unhealthy, even for people in the normal sector, but especially unhealthy for people like me because I'm only one tier away from being in a tendency where my functionality could be impaired. Something to keep in mind. How would you incorporate, if at all, anxiety or your stress response into this um... I, I guess, biological depression. Do you have any versions of those when you react to a, let's say, pessimistic, depressive episode? So anxiety, that's a really good one. So we're talking about cortisol levels and adrenaline levels rising in your blood. And then that gets you just ready for anything. You're ready to either stay still and not do anything or you're ready to like sprint 100 yards. That's exactly what these uh, stimulants do in your body. They're meant for you to survive short-term conflict. But you can't keep doing it. You can't keep doing it. The, for the long-term effects of what it does to you neurologically and into your organs and your torso here, it, it's, it's catastrophic. You need to be able to find a way to, to get some kind of trust and help. Otherwise, you're going to always feel like that. And anxiety, it's something we do need to overcome. It's something we do need to overcome in more than just, I need to face this one particular person, but I need to face work. I need to face the suffering of life. I need to face um, paying my bills and taking care of my responsibilities. Well, specific to you though, do you experience that anxiety or not really necessarily? Oh, uh, my personal experience is for sure. Um, at, Anytime at work when there's going to be short-term conflict, you bet that goes up. I'm an agreeable personality type. So what that means is I'm going to be more likely to avoid conflict and negotiate. Negotiating is a good thing. But when we have to do short-term conflict, I have to psych myself up for it. I can't just go there. Pers disagreeable personality types, they can just go there. That's already who they are. I have to actually transcend a tier or two of my typical personality warm up and then do it. And then I'll probably right. be tired after. So, and that's from the after effect of the adrenaline and the cortisol wearing off that our body normally pr produces during short-term conflict. In your specific case, uh, to go back to the, uh, pessimist anxiety, uh, what was the other word? Uh, I'm blanking on it. Um, what depression? Uh, anxiety. yes, depression. It, yeah. it was depression. <laughs> yeah. The, what, uh, what was, what anxiety. Was again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, depression, pessimism, uh, anxiety. Let's call it a trifecta for now. Um, would you say you're more weighted on the pessimistic side and then, but the other two still influence it, I guess? 
He's such an abstract guy. Yeah. So if we're talking about the triangle and pessimism sure. is on this side, and then you got uh, anxiety at the top and depression on the right, I'm definitely more on the left here. Way more on but, just the pessimism side. Um, but definitely okay. I lean a little bit towards enough where depression has to be considered to be something I need to fight off from time to time. Um, and anxiety for sure. I mean, that, that, that comes up too. So probably somewhere in the middle, but leaning on the pessimism. I, I ask because I don't really feel uh, pessimism that much compared to the more anxiety-based or depressive-based episodes that I may incur. But I'm pretty sure that anxiety is more of a stress anxiety for me specifically. And the basis for that that I've uh, come to concluded is because of those five things being out of whack. Because I'm putting all this external stresses on, additional on top of on top of my body. So just a stimulus response of my body doing a, a, a feedback, right? So, oh, I'm not, I'm thirsty, right? I'm dehydrated. My mind's all loopy and I'm, I can't. I'm not clear headed, so I'm not going to be firing on eight cylinders, right? And then, oh, I'm hungry, just compounding effect. Oh, um, I'm sleep deprived. It's like cubic, it keeps uh, exponentiating, right? To the point um, where you might blow up if you're not careful with the re one more circumstance that might be bang, Julian does something that's radically <laughs> different than his personality. So far, that hasn't happened. More of it is, a, let's, I would say, characterize it as a self self destruction. Like it's not externalized on the world, which is good in one sense, but not good because internalizing all of that right means that to get back to some kind of subpar baseline, whatever percentage lower from the normal baseline, I need a lot of rest. It's kind of, it kind of has an intersection with introversion, extroversion. Like if I'm in an extroverted environment way too much, loud noises, loud people, party goers, really drains me. And the anxiety, let's say, the stress of that situation just physically drains me. And then I can get, I can swing towards more of a, okay, I, I'm not feeling it. I'm pretty exhausted. I'm out of it, right? And that swing, that swing process happens the longer I'm in that environment. So it, it's kind of the interplay, right? The interplay of, oh, my biology is having a reaction to the environment that's in. And for me, the best measured approach to get out of that is to get out of that, get out of the situation I'm in, and then uh, pamper myself with all the things that I need sleep, food, water, etc. Exercise, sun, sun. <laughs> so, um, and if I leave all those out, then I'm just asking for trouble. It's like, just get the baseline down, and then I'll be okay, and it'll be manageable. But if I can't even afford myself that uh, luxury, then it's going to be a tough time. And being a tough time with all of those different compounding factors, that's, again, the reason why we wanted to talk about the biological root causes to people who do get depressed. Because really, if you can't solve that, you're not going to be able to solve the environmental problems that are going to show up, let's say, when you walk into an extroverted environment or when you walk into an unfamiliar environment, because some people, they fall into the anxiety category way more than they do in the pessimistic. And that sucks right. for them because new environments, that's exactly what anxiety kicks in for them. Yep. I can empathize with that. Exactly. So it, as far as other people in your life, Julian, have you noticed like some of these tendencies in, in some of your friend groups or um, in other folk? Uh, personally, in my experience, there's only one main person that comes to mind. We live with him. Yep. And 
that individual was very yeah he was definitely a textbook biological depression where something in either his genetics or just the way that he expressed himself was just very much um working against him uh 95 percent of the time which is sad to see because it's like in that case I'm sure he would have been an excellent candidate for medic med medication instead of just normal uh, self-treatment, let's say. Normal in the sense that, oh, that's your baseline, that's where you work from. But if you're so outside the norm, like say you're down to 50% of the norm, right? Everything that we just talked about, if that's occurring to you, that could bring you down to like 75 or even 100% below the norm. And those individuals have an extremely tough time. And the I would argue that even if they were able to get all their self-help stuff squared away, like self-treatment, uh, let's say, um, they still may need to see medical professionals and get the help that they need. And with that said about about our particular roommate, it it was way more than just environment. And with him, it, there was something interlocked that need it needs to get out of there. It can't just you need to trust somebody. You need to trust somebody, get out, get some help. And if for the people who are really biologically depressed, the the last resort really is medication. But and that's what it's for. Medication wasn't meant for people at the norm to be above average. That's a bad idea. You don't want yeah. that. You want it for biological replacement because for some reason your genes are not producing enough neurochemistry in your head to keep you sane. Uh, period. That's a that's an easy uh, way to think about it for meds. For people who can function with being 10% below the average population in terms of inflammation and or happiness level, that's fine. They're okay. They just need to be aware of that they're not going to be as happy as the rest of us. Um, and that's me. That's me. I, I, I'm not as happy as everyone else, um, but I won't make them unhappy. What I'll do is, is just give the pessimistic view to the table and then hopefully give them some tools on how to, how to get above um, what we're doing here with whatever activity is going on in the social world or in the work world. And that seems to be a good medium. Because that's what pessimism is good for. It's for preparing for problems. Um, and happy people, if you're happy all the time, you're not always thinking about that. You're just thinking about the next next fun thing to do. And that's not necessarily useful when you're actually in trouble. Right. And then just to bring it up, because it may uh, be on people's minds, uh, if you're having a temporary bout of depression, definitely don't resort to medication. Uh, first, see if you can switch out of that temporary bout into a more, uh, I guess, more pleasing environment, for one. And really consider, like, oh, are you a naturally happy person? Meaning, like, when you wake up each day, you're just gleam glaring ear to ear or just, like, very content, right? then probably a lot of what we talked about so far in the podcast wouldn't necessarily apply to you. And it would be a difficult reference point to understand uh, this perspective. And then that's tricky, though, because if you're... Because uh, I've had episodes of this where I'm extremely happy for some reason. It doesn't make any sense because my normal baseline is, like, demurred and kind of, like... Uh, I guess, numb, numbish, let's say. Uh, but there's been those instances of, like, you know, elation or whatever. And I realized, like, oh, no, that's that's a temporary situational thing, right? Similarly, if you're extremely happy and then you find yourself in a sad situation, you have to be mindful of the broader context of your whole life and your reaction to stimuli. And just to be very careful about properly analyzing your own issues, your own sense of uh, 
I guess, depression. So with you, Julian, uh, the euphoria you had, let's say, in some of your extreme cases, um, if the norm being the center usually, um, where's your norm and then where's your euphoria in comparison to like the average? So euphoria rarely, if ever, happens. So it's very dramatic in terms of, oh, wow, this thing came about this year or this decade even. Um, that's a very notable instance. So it's like four or five standard deviations outside of where my baseline is, let's say. Wow. Where I, so like maybe two standard deviations is about like pleasantly surprised, like pretty, pretty mildly happy. And then the norm is more like uh, neither up nor down too far, but closer to down. And then the other direction would be like extreme depressive episode, which doesn't really happen either for me specifically because it's largely uh, manageable at the moment. Back in the day when I think my body was being supercharged with hormones, those much bigger swings. And that's also another thing to consider is like, how old are you? Are you going through puberty or are you settled into your adult body, right? Because uh, to my understanding, your brain and body for guys are still developing until your early 20s. And then even then, it's like kind of risky to say that you're settled into your being by that time. For me specifically, um, I would say i been roughly in the same spot since about 23, 24, which is good. There's consistency in that. But before then, there was much uh, broader swings that I noticed. And I didn't take those high points, like very high points and very low points that seriously because I knew that the baseline was, you know, for all intents and purposes, fine, manageable. I don't know if you've had a similar, like, experience with that. Oh, sure. I mean, man, what's the happiest I've ever been? I mean, um, are we talking about for standard deviations compared to the normal public? Like, we're going to use uh, that as a, no. as a guide or, yeah. like, my own? Uh, Your own subjective uh, take. Oh, well, if we're going to go that way, I guess it's easier to talk about. Um, four or five standard deviations, that's not very much. Um, but... I would be saying I'd be hitting a lot of, there's like a cluster of three standard deviations for like the real big parts of life that have been, and it's usually with liberating, overcoming something, uh, getting someone else to understand and pull them out of a mess. Usually it's something like that. So it's the major events of life and liberating somebody else um, and really connecting with someone um, for, for once. And, because sometimes it gets superficial, and when you really get those, man, that that's like a three standard deviation for me. Um, and I have a cluster of those, so that's like overcoming a university, overcoming high school, and all of its problems that I talked about. Because it wasn't just that one gal; it was also just the overwhelming amount of work to just bench every day to try and I want to leave Porterville, I want right. to get out. That was hard. Um, get there, that chick um you know the slumberger thing that we talked about um where margo and i were on the beach and uh she's wondering about life and she goes jake can you think of one person that's happy at slumberger and it's just like whoa we really connected on, on on that or i could think of a few others that were just absolutely amazing um and i've got a cluster of those but well, that's not most of life. That's the highlights. Um, if you go back, I mean, if you get away from the Facebook photos for a little bit and the, the superficial set side of it and seeing all of the good stuff, I'd say most of it really is like negative 0.5 standard deviation. That's really most of it. Because again, that's going to be the pessimism. That's going to be the slight 10 to 15% below where it should be. But that is how I operate. And that's how I function. Um, it's not that I don't function. It's just that's that's going to be the flow path. 
And not everyone thinks that way. Most people are not irritated by little things. Uh, it doesn't bother them, but for me, it can bother me a lot, um, especially when things get political or if things uh, don't go anywhere or everyone's out for themselves. That's when I really start going the other direction, like negative one and a half deviations. Right. Could you expand more upon how isolation specifically affects you and the negative effects you felt from it from specifically your job? Because if I recall correctly in our pre-planning, you've gone on at length to describe how basically working the hours you do and the shift in day to night is just very uh, taxing and could be laborious of if you didn't get like a handle on it to try to make it work for your current situation. Sure. Yeah, I, I can, I can elaborate on that and I can elaborate on the, just the general purpose mindset of what's going on there with the job. So if you're ever working uh, an off shift hours, keep in mind it's healthier psychologically sometimes, but you're going to pay for it with the physical aspect of staying up all night. That's something I was willing to trade at the time and that was something I've, I've stuck with for for now the problem that comes up is usually the fact that you're not operating when everyone else is so you're off the world clock when you wake up it's really stressful when you get all these emails let's say and not just like work emails or anything like that I'm talking about just news in general the world has already woken up for eight hours so the rate at which you caught up to information it wasn't as if you were already up and you saw it incrementally put into your day. You saw it all in one blast. And then it's really frustrating because there's a lot to catch up on as you're waking up. It's not necessarily a fun experience. Um, what else is not necessarily fun is that, again, everyone else is on a different schedule. So when you're trying to bond with other people or you're trying to trying to get sketches to work out and it doesn't, it's just, ah, okay, well, it didn't work out because we didn't find a time that works between the two of us uh, that made sense. Um, but the third thing that, that really can uh, knock me off my wagon is when the teamwork aspect just isn't happening. So there's a tendency for people on normal working hours to assume everything's gonna go fine and they hand it to us and then they give us responsibility and things are just going to go. It's that's there's an expectation we're going to pull through for them all the time, all the time. And when we don't pull through and deliver on exactly what the expectations were from the normal working hour folk, like nine to five people, they get extremely uh, inflamed in the production world. And that's something that I noticed pretty early on. And I go, huh. At the, at the same time. If they didn't finish everything and we're actually doing more than we're supposed to, it's just neutral. But if we don't finish everything that they expected, all of a sudden we're the bad guy. That definitely is a big biological factor because there it's not just psychological in terms of uh, me uh, versus uh, management or me versus uh, particular people or whoever's working. It, it, this is independent of a job title. This is just... Uh, different shifts that have to interact with each other. The main thing there is they are not on your side when they talk like that. That's the big thing. And there's a biological counter in your head going, danger, trouble. They do not care about us. That means right. that we need to be more careful. Cortisol goes up, anxiety goes up, responsibility goes up. And now you're operating not as effectively because there's more on your back just from everybody putting that stuff on you. And that, that happens in day shift too, but it's a, it manifests in a different way. But the problem with off shift work is that it's going to get put on you all at once because that's their, here's the end of the day. Here's everything that didn't get done. And then they drop it and then, whoa, that's a lot or, oh, that's nothing. And, it, you never know how it's going to play out because some days it's the opposite. Nothing got dropped and it's, oh, it's just a normal day. And uh, it's hard to plan. It's hard to plan for dealing with um, those 
types of problems that show up. Um, when it's consistent problems is when you got to watch out because it's going to really tax you. Right. Um, yeah, interesting. Hmm. I wanted to take a quick moment to segue into what we came up with the layers of depression. Yeah. If it's okay by you, I just kind of want to read it. And then we can segue from that into uh, solutions, coping mechanisms for uh, biological uh, depression. Does that sound good? You're live, buddy. Go ahead. So for layers of depression, what we came away with is that you have uh, the surface level depression. So that's anything anyone else could see. So basically, oh, you look sad. You're more haggard than normal. You're dressing poorly. There's just a bunch of visual cues. The stuff you talk about can also be affected by that. Um, when I'm for me specifically, when I'm particularly sad, a lot of people point that out, right? They notice that, oh, you look worse than normal. Like they just straight up say it, which is good. Uh, if they didn't verbally tell me that, then I'd probably be like, oh, okay, well, I must be going through a pretty rough, uh, going, it, my biological self must be going through a pretty rough time if everything's like visibly off, off kilter. And then the next layer was, oh, my own thoughts about that, the subsurface layer, we called it. And basically it's my own thoughts about, uh, okay, am I going through this episode right now? Or is it just like, I'm a little bit off because I didn't eat or anything like that. And then the last layer is basically what we've been talking about the whole podcast, which is the hormones and the feedback loops and basically all that stuff back flowing up top into your thoughts and into uh, to what people actually see. So what that basically means is, well, your natural tendency in your case is to be a pessimist. So that back flows up into your thoughts about, okay, I'm going to, I'm, uh, I don't think that'll work. I'm not too hopeful about the future, blah, 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 blah. Um, and then when you're talking with other people, like your friends, essentially, uh, they're, uh, noticing that, Hey, Jacob, are you all right? You seem like more, uh, pessimistic than normal. They actually like check in with you if they're aware that this is outside or abnormally outside your current behavior. So given all that framework, um, what are some coping mechanisms that you're aware of? You, you gave a few here and there sprinkled throughout the podcast, but like as a structural procedure that you specifically go through for yourself to stop yourself from just going too far down the rabbit hole of pessimistic depression? What are some coping mechani mechanisms that you've employed? Sounds good. We got a, a pessimism's SOP to managing their slightly depressive and functioning depression old uh, traits. Yes. So uh, first things first, man, we've already talked about the biological really hard on the diet, exercise, sleep, eating, the sun, water, like that's, that's still a thing. Um, but we're going to dive into each one on why it's important. So the water, it's so important to be drinking water instead of like soda and stuff. The, the soda, it's not that the water and the soda is bad. It's the other stuff that's in it. It's the additional sugar and fructose that your body has to filter out in your liver. That is a big problem. The other problem with it is if you're drinking a fair amount of sugary substances or consuming it rather your large and small or mostly your large intestine your gut biome is going to want to have to eat a lot of that stuff so you're going to produce these different microbes and reinforce that behavior so they're going to not only want more sugar but they're also going to drag you down with them oh i, I must have more sugar i must have it and unfortunately, that's not necessarily a nutritious thing in large quantities. So not only do you have a I want sugar mentality, but you have the rate at which you're driving towards it in your own gut biome. 
Now that'd be cool if it only stayed down in your gut. Problem is, research is saying that it actually affects your neurochemistry. So if it affects your neurochemistry, now all that sugar intake actually does impact your brain. And I'm not saying don't eat sugar. What I'm saying is manage it. And an easy way to manage it is don't drink it. I mean, that's way too easy to go up on your sugar intake. Drink water, dilute it, find a way to manage that part of your life. And to build off of that, what the listeners should be aware of is food maps, which are a bunch of sugar related groups that uh, manifest themselves in like fructose. That's what F in food map stands for. And then all the other ones are kind of complicated uh, names that I can't pronounce. But basically, they're all different types of sugars that affect that microbiome that Jacob mentioned. And if those spike in your body, in your gut, the mind gut connection will get flared up, basically. And the best course of action, as Jacob mentioned, is to minimize or eliminate even those foods if you have a particularly adverse reaction. This is especially true of people with IBS, which they still don't understand quite exactly the mechanisms behind why it works. But the general advice is try an elimination diet, see which foods affect you and your mood. And if that alleviates the symptoms, then just don't have those foods. So that's already a big thing right there is the, just the food and water consumption. Um, other foods, I'm not going to tell people what to eat, but you should go and find out what does make you feel better. Seriously. And um, for me, meat and vegetables, great idea. Too bad I hate vegetables, so I got to blend it. But once I blend it, I drink it, I put vitamins in there, call it a day, I have a nice smoothie. Now I can get my nutrients. And that's actually been a big win for me because now I can actually not just eat, you know, meat, pizza, and you know, whatever else I want from the store. But that's been so important to have that fruit and vegetables intake well blended um because now i'll actually do it before it was a real chore to eat spinach but now it's come on that, that's gonna get blended up in some cranberry juice and before you know it it's in a nice nice cup and then i drink it um some other things to consider with diet though um you want to have some macronutrients and you want to know when you're eating if you're eating 10 times a day and you're doing like a 14 hour eat cycle that's horrible you need to give your body time to fast. There's something called autophagy or the eating of cells. It's the, the body's process of removing damaged pieces of, of live cells in your body so that way the rest of the body can survive. And if you don't allow some kind of fasting in, in between meals, between days, that gets affected and then those cells never get eaten or taken apart or removed altogether. So it's a big deal to watch the times when you're eating and the quantity and that part I think is even more important because if you can't get rid of that, heck, a lot of cancer is the fact that we allowed a lot of these cells to keep coming up in our body because autophagy wasn't taking place to get rid of them. So that's something to keep in mind too and that would help with the inflammation part. The sugar definitely is an inflammatory uh, consumable that we have. And that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and that's and that's not just uh, relegated to table tabletop sugar. That's also in carbs. So if you have an excessive amount of carbs, complex sugars, then your body converts that into the simpler sugars for for digestion, and that can have an inflammatory response as well. And then, say you get your necessary water intake and you've managed your diet, you also have to keep in mind exercise. So my freshman year of college, I met this one girl who had very severe, I guess, I wouldn't call it bipolar, but depressive episodes where she'd be very high and ecstatic and then have these big crashes. And also from my understanding of what current day psychologists are rec recommending to patients uh, the first thing to help alleviate all that pent-up mental energy 
that you might be having throughout the day is just to exercise, specifically cardio and running. Um, so what my friend would do to alleviate her, um, like just anxious thoughts or excitability was go on three hour runs in the evening. And that happened to do the trick to calm her down and to allow her to focus on her tasks at hand. Uh, similarly, if you're just lethargic throughout the day and lacking energy, exercising can give your organs and body and blood flow a necessary turbocharge so that you're not feeling so apathetic about just existing. Because everyone's um, experienced that couch potato like feeling where you don't want to move and you feel kind of awful <laughs> uh, just uh, having your full size Costco pizza. Hey, um, <laughs> I feel attacked. I like my Costco pizza a lot, but, but it comes I, at I a cost. It, uh, yeah, it does. Ten seventy seven. That's not that much. Um, there's more than that. Yeah, no. Hey, right. So. To be fair, I do about three miles of swimming a week. That's what I do so I can have that, okay? And that, to me, is, is a big win. But for some people, that's catastrophic. Because yes. especially if you're like 140 pounds or something like that, you try and do that. Not and you have a big pizza, right? It's not for everybody. And I'm definitely definitely want to get that across especially for that kind of quantity and to go back to exercising though not to take a pot shot at costco pizza uh too late too too much <laughs> um the key with exercising to make it actually effective rather than uh like a piece of clothing you can wear on and off whenever you please is to have a set schedule and regular consistency so your body adapts appropriately to expecting the exercise and then reaping the benefits from the elation, the euphoria that you get afterwards. If you don't have that schedule, uh, it you could be okay, but consistency like your sleep cycle with your exercise cycle can be very... Uh, uh, help it can help you significantly with your uh, what's that heart thing the circadian rhythm where your your heart's uh has it it's on a timer basically uh this is a specific word for it what like a pacemaker that no space? that's a no uh circadian uh rhythm yeah that's what it is. Uh, physical, mental, behavioral changes that follow a daily cycle. So you want to incorporate exercise into that rhythm so that you reap the you maximize your benefits from it. Yeah, just to add to what Julian was getting at. Yeah, habits. 